So hi, as I said, my name is Julia Richardson. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I'm a therapist at Inova Keller Center. Um, I was telling you guys a little bit about my background and what's brought me to this. About two years ago, I started doing the trainings, the ECHO trainings monthly, which is like a once a month lunch training, exactly 60 minutes you pre present on your topic. And we have a group of physicians who track together through a whole year and they get CMEs for that. And through that, they can also use... Um, I'll talk more about that later, but they can get quality improvement CMEs for their practice. We coach them through that if they want to use mental health as their quality improvement um, measure for the year, which they're all required to do now. Um, I started training on that two years ago and really enjoyed it. And then when they needed to have uh, a therapist as they're expanding the hubs and expanding the VMAP program, they wanted to have a therapist and a care navigator in each of the five regions that they, they divided our state into five regions. It doesn't really follow any other kind of regions like region, you know, for CSBs or for, it's just their own cutting of the map. So I'll show you what it looks like later. Um, but they decided they needed five therapists, five care navigators, and they had a psychiatrist in each region who t they all take turns. Um, but there's somebody on call, multiple psychiatrists, child and adolescent psychiatrists on call at any given time to consult with primary care doctors. And this is all just for primary care for people serving birth to their 23rd birthday. So all the way through age 22. We don't care if they turn 23 after we start working with them. <laughs> and for all for mental health, really focused on their mental health and on helping primary care providers managing mental health in a variety of different primary care settings, whether it's a pediatrician's office, family practice, sometimes even specialists that are running across mental health. Like we had a nephrologist call in an OBGYN recently. Um, and then of course, free clinics and urgent cares, even the emergency room can get the ball rolling with a VMAP consult. So all kinds of providers call us for help with mental health. And that's how I got started. For the last year, I've been doing it half time. So they still wanted me to do my supervisory um, kind of like intake management job half time, which is a little bit of a rodeo. And then also doing this half time. And just recently, October 1st, I got to do VMAP full time. So now I'm very excited and I have my full schedule open up to really dig into outreach and to understanding our region, all the different parts of our region. Because even though we're Northern region, we're very diverse up here. And so really wanting to understand um, what are the different needs in the different areas and how can I connect with the practices differently. So that's what I'm all about. Uh, let me share you my slides a little. Oh, Renee, you have to let me maybe be a co-host. Are you guys pretty visual people? I'm pretty visual, so I like to see things visually. But if you prefer just to see me and just have me talk, I'm happy to do that too. <laughs> Sometimes people can get kind of Zoom fatigue if you use slides too much. Any preferences? I like slides. Okay. Uh, you're great. Um, Pretty visual. Slides good too. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let me go ahead and, and share them then. So I want to talk to you about an overview of the program for sure, but also I wanted to tell you a little bit about levels of care because I'm finding that as I do this outreach and as I explain what VMAP can do, there's a little bit of a... Um, a need for knowledge about what the middle levels of care are. So I've started integrating it into all of my, like, what is VMAP thing, just so that people know what's available and what's out there. So I already introduced myself. I am the Northern Region Licensed Mental Health Person, provider person. And here are the key statistics that you would wanna kind of take away of why VMAP exists, because um, we have a shortage of mental health providers. If everybody could just get straight into a provider's office, there would be no need really for primary care to take on such a burden of uh, treating and identifying mental health disorders, but we don't have enough. And in Virginia, there's only 13 child and adolescent psychiatrists per 100,000, which they say is a very bad shortage compared to where they would like us to be. And of over 65% of pediatricians in 2017 said they lacked um, the mental health and behavioral health knowledge and skills that they needed to treat it. We have some more recent information here too. So when we look at it on a map, this is what it looks like in our state. These are all the counties and the counties in red have a severe shortage of child and adolescent psychiatrists. Um, they have one to 17 total. And then the counties that are in yellow have a high shortage. And then there's only those two counties <laughs> that had enough. And I think UVA is over here and I don't know what's over here. Something's over here that's got a bunch of psych child and adolescent psychiatrists. Now, this is only child and adolescent psychiatrists, so it doesn't factor in like nurse practitioners who also see kids, a psychiatric nurse practitioners, for example. But then look at all the gray counties. Those have nobody. There's no child and adolescent psychiatrist practicing in that county. 
And then since COVID, I mean, they've done a new survey. The Virginia chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics surveyed their pediatricians. And this is what they're finding is that most pediatricians were strongly finding that they did not have adequate access to psychiatry. They didn't have adequate access to therapy. They didn't feel like they were able to meet the the needs of children. And when they needed a consultation, they were not able to receive one in a timely manner. So that's our solution is VMAP. And VMAP is not a new idea. Having a statewide um, supportive consultation program for primary care providers for kids, not new. They, I think we're like the 30th, we're behind the ball. <laughs> The idea has been around for a long time and HRSA has a special grant for it. So that's how ours started. A local pediatrician up here in Northern Virginia, Dr. Sandy Chung, applied and got our first HRSA grant. And then from there, the ball got it rolling and the state has now decided to fully fund our program. So it's not just a consult line, but it's an education program. It's a full consultation with both psychiatrists and therapists and care navigation as well in all the regions. So really expanding capacity with all that. The four pillars or central tenets of VMAP are education, consultation, care navigation, and eventually a telehealth component to the consultation. So we want to be able to have telehealth consultations where we could kind of co-consult with the provider. So the primary care provider could like use some kind of telehealth platform for the psychiatrist or therapist to speak with the patient alongside them and help guide them. So the, right in the middle of COVID, our budget was up. And we figured we were going to get cut from the budget because, you know, we're a little program and there was a lot of state revenue loss because of COVID. But they decided to come through and gave us an extra $5.4 million for COVID. I mean, despite all the COVID um, shortfalls in the budget. And we're now fully funded for psychiatrists and therapists in all of the five regions. And they're actively working on hiring all of them. So you can see we still started with this HRSA money and then the grant from Fairfax County and some money that was raised privately, but now it's majority state money. And they've committed this for the next two years. And we have strong bipartisan support for this issue. It's not um, something that we're, they've given us any indication that, that they don't think will continue to be funded or be successful. In each of the five regions, this is how they've split it up, which is kind of like, I scratch my head too sometimes because I'm like, wait, what? but okay, this is how they split us up. <laughs> and they, they, have um, partnerships in each of these five regions with really big community um, behavioral health providers. And they really wanted to have a partnership in each region and have therapists and psychiatrists in each region who understood behavioral health um, needs and also availability of resources, how to get through those resources, what the economy of mental health is in those regions. And so as you can see up here in the Northern region, um, I'm placed at ANOVA. So I'm an ANOVA employee and a VMAP employee in the partnership. And then a lot of our doctors, I think all of them right now are through Children's National and they are in partnership with VMAP as well. So when we are on VMAP time, we are entirely on VMAP time. Uh, we are not in clinic, we're not seeing other people. Right now, here's our team. Uh, we have our team of psychiatrists who are all amazing child and adolescent psychiatrists who each specialize in something different and cool. So if somebody calls on a day um, where I know, you know, like, oh, that's Dr. Register Brown's thing, autism and developmental, dis you know, differences, maybe we could wait until Monday and call her <laughs> and always talk through that. It's amazing to have these resources. And then Millie de Patricio is our care navigator. She's full time. Um, just does care navigation for VMAP, which is helping families. I'll go into a little bit about what a consultation is. Um, it's a call on the phone. The primary care doctor or office has to contact us first and say, hey, we would like a consult. They can do that online in our form, or they can just call us. We have a phone line and we answer um, nine to five, Monday through Friday. But because of the consult time, we ask them to call by 4.30 at the latest, just to make sure we have enough time to consult that day. And then um, the psychiatrist provides assistance. They provide recommendations for the primary care and they kind of guide them in case conceptualization, diagnosis, prescribing, um, kind of considerations of family, biopsychosocial and medical care considerations and implications, and then level of care referral for sure. Like what level of care would be the right thing that guides care navigation. The notes from those consults are emailed to the provider within two days without P any PHI involved. So no names, date of birth, anything like that, so that it can be a little bit more secure. We still email it encrypted, I think. 
um, yeah, we always email them encrypted. And then uh, consult with a licensed mental health provider, very similar to the psychiatrist, um, provide assistance with everything except for the uh, prescribing and medical care considerations. So anybody who has complex medical issues or is taking a medication, any questions around medication definitely goes to the psychiatrist. And anytime anybody wants a psychiatrist, um, we're, we're getting them on the line. Sometimes people want to talk to me over a psychiatrist. So it's kind of their preference. We're both available and we work really closely together. So it's not kind of an either or situation. For care navigation, um, Millie provides resources either to the primary care doctor, if that's what they request, or to both the family and the primary care doctor. So she can work directly with the families. And that's mostly what primary care doctors ask for is um, really for her to partner with the family. She contacts the family within two business days, and then she starts by forming an understanding of what they've already done and tried. So she really kind of comes from this perspective of partnering with the family rather than kind of just giving them resources and telling them good luck. Like, what have you already tried? Where are you at? What are your needs? What are your concerns? She talks them through kind of the process of getting on wait lists. If there's a lot of wait lists for the, the service that they're going to be going for, helps them understand what to expect from a therapist or a psychiatrist. Um, a lot of details about what their service is, is for. Um, and Millie also speaks Spanish fluently. It's her first language. So she's very aware and understanding of cultural differences and understanding behavioral health and um, stigma in the community. She can describe services and how really help people overcome any barriers, practical or sociocultural, to get, get care. Um, she follows up with them every week or two um, until the patient's seen by those providers or until the family no longer wants care navigation. Sometimes they tell her, oh, no, I got it from here. That's totally fine. The care navigator emails the primary care doctors to update them on their activities. So they'll say, like, your patient was seen by developmental pediatrics, for example, and I'm no longer going to do care navigation, things like that. Sometimes families will tell us something different than the primary care doctor. They'll say, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want a therapist. I just want a psychiatrist for medication. And Millie will say, okay. And she'll email the primary care doctor. They don't want a therapist. They just want a psychiatrist for medication. That's okay. But we always keep the primary care doctors updated because we're not taking on a patient relationship, provider relationship with, with the families. We know that everything we're doing is adjunctive to the primary care doctor. So we really want to partner with them. So really quick, I wanted to tell you guys about levels of care and an opportunity that I see with VMAP in terms of improving access to the middle levels of care, preventing hospitalizations and worsening of, of symptoms. So everybody knows the highest, right? Inpatient psychiatric care, residential treatment, one flew over the cuckoo's nest kind of thing. <laughs> and everybody seems to know the lowest, which is like psychotherapy, weekly talk therapy, maybe seeing a psychiatrist every once in a while for medication. But what's in the middle? <laughs> I know you guys all probably know what's in the middle, <laughs> but a lot of people don't seem to in the primary care world where they get confused about what is it and how do you know that they need something in the middle. And I'm not expecting primary care doctors to really gain an understanding and be very targeted in these referrals, but just know that there is a middle and that if someone's presenting with middle kind of things that you don't start from the bottom of the pyramid, it's okay to start in the middle and at the bottom at the same time. I conceptualize the levels of care as sort of a pyramid like this with the lowest level at the bottom, it's going to be the foundation of their treatment and the highest level at the top, which would be the least, ideally would be the least utilized. Unfortunately, these days, when we look at care utilization, it's more of an hourglass with a lot of inpatient treatment and not enough utilization of intensive outpatient and other intent, more intensive programs to keep kids out of hospitalizations. So we often find kids floundering or not making progress in the lowest level of care and then kind of just going right to the top of having an inpatient stay or a residential stay. We really would like to see kids getting referred more often and appropriately into more middle levels of care. So what are those? So the next level up from just outpatient therapy would be intensive in-home therapy, applied behavioral analysis, like intensive outpatient program, which is what I was talking about, that nine to, nine to 12 hours a week is usually what they are. Partial hospitalization is 20 or more hours a week and these are defined by insurance this isn't like program to program um they do differ a little bit but they're that's the minimum insurance requirement for those to be billed as iop and php and then there's this cool thing right between partial hospitalization and crisis stabilization called residential prevention or it's an oxymoron you guys have probably heard of it <laughs> in-home residential or virtual residential 
which is an oxymoron, but it's a really cool program that's only available to some parts of the state and some kinds of insurances, but it's a good thing to know about that it does exist. So when kids are coming down from the hospital or residential or kind of needing to prevent that, they're escalating in their home, but we can catch that soon enough. If we match it, we can hopefully prevent further need for increasing levels of care. So just to elaborate on a one pager, if someone wanted to take this with them later <laughs> or give it to a family and explain, I put it all in one page, what I said. Um, I really like to stratify it based on intensiveness of how many hours a week it is. So it's like kind of moving on up. And then I put, again, put it all on one slide with the top and the bottom in case somebody likes it and they want to print it out. This is something that I get from my echoes, <laughs> my echo trainings. I often put a lot of information, dump it in a slide because then it can later be a resource, but I'm not going to read to you from there. So um, we're really hoping that more, more primary care providers will consult and will register. They don't have to register, but they certainly can. And we really hope that they'll join us for education. All of our education opportunities are at vmap.org and they break down into two basic versions. It's the echoes that I talked about, which is the monthly lunch trainings where you commit to doing it for about 10 months and you have the same cohort of PCPs and trainers. And there's a lunch talk on a different topic, really important topics, like really to the point information. We only talk for about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And then we have a case presentation and apply that information to the case presentation. It's pretty cool. And then, um, our REACH program, which is a three-day intensive training program. REACH itself calls itself a mini fellowship, which I think is kind of weird, but it's really focused on behavioral health for pediatricians and for primary care providers who see young people. So it's really focused on like prescribing, therapy, psychopharmacology, all the interesting stuff. And it's run by child and adolescent psychiatrists. VMAP has trained its own trainers. So now uh, providers don't have to pay as much and go to the REACH Institute to get it. All the information's on the website, and there's actually one upcoming November 5th through 7th. So it's usually a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, all virtual since COVID. So any uh, primary care provider who sees kids and young adults in the community could register for that. It's $100 for their CME certificate, um, just for the admin part of that and the processing. And that's it. So our kind of parameters are our call center. Um, patients have to be 22 years or younger. Patients either have to be a Virginia resident or they have to see their provider in Virginia, one or the other. Sometimes we have patients who maybe live in Maryland. Um, if that's the case, sometimes we work with like Maryland or DC version of VMAP, but those are our general parameters. So I want to leave some time for questions. I don't want to talk too, too long. Thoughts, questions. Julia, Julia, I remember yesterday you said that um, it they don't have to be documented either. Is that right? Oh yeah, people don't have. There's no no payment. There's no requirement for families. We work with undocumented families. We work with um, all different situations. You know, kids on probation and kids with different kinds of insurance and multiple insurances and lapses of insurance and all kinds of complications. Um, different language needs different abilities. Julia, you talked a little bit yesterday about the, the you know, seems like some of the younger docs kind of uh, uh, gravitate to this approach more than, than maybe older docs that just do not want to touch mental health. Um, I, it, you know, it's interesting. We, another thing we did in partnership with the Mental Health Association was a reach training here and, uh, Sally, remind me, I mean, it was pretty minimal local involvement, right? We ended up getting a lot from, we had somebody from Alabama join in, didn't we, or Georgia. Uh, but I don't know, have you seen any successful recruitment strategies on this, Julia? Is, is, are there ways that we could help try to recruit? I know Josh Jacobs out there pushing it, you know, and you're familiar with his work. Uh, he's he's bought in a hundred percent, but that doesn't seem to and, and and Rob's wife as well. But it just doesn't seem to be translating into a lot of other docs getting on board. I think there's a couple of things going on. Our marketing people always remind us that people have to see something five times before it really sticks. That's why they invest in advertising. <laughs> so VMAP has started investing a little bit more in advertising and being 
um, seen and visible. Whereas before it was kind of just like, we have this amazing thing you need. Why do we have to advertise it? <laughs> like, doesn't it sell itself? And so now they're, they're recognizing they need to get it out more. And that's why we're trying to spread the word even to non-providers about what it is and how to ask for it and how to just make it part of the normal system. I think we also talked yesterday about um, primary care providers being very stretched right now. Since COVID, it has been absolutely grueling to be a primary care provider. I mean, it's been hard to be a human being, but to be a primary care provider and keep up with the changes day to day, hour to hour, for the last almost two years, it's been very grueling. And then there's a lot of physical health stuff that's happened. A lot of families uh, delayed well care visits. So then coming back into school, it was an onslaught. It was a total onslaught. There's also staffing issues. So a lot of them don't have the front desk staff, the techs, the nurses that they need in their offices. I see some of you guys are experiencing this too. It's, it's tough. And so I think asking them to do another thing within their system, within their kind of like routine that they've learned, which, you know, when we're under stress, we have to go back to like our routines and, and our strategies and patterns. It's a, it's a lot, it's a lot to ask. And so that's one of the things I try to address in all of my outreach and even my phone calls, consultations with providers is like, how do I make this more doable for you? And how do we make this easier for your office? So really kind of getting things ahead of the ball, like putting safety plans in your office, figuring out ways to integrate referral lists into your EMR. If you're using an EMR that like prints off referral lists or something, having already handouts on sleep hygiene, on keeping a safe house. If you have a kid who's cutting themselves or is having suicidal thoughts, having those resources available. So Innova actually partnered with a bunch of local providers and made a toolkit and, and VMAP is working on making their own toolkit as well. So that they can have that handy electronically and, and in paper if they want one. Um, because that's a huge barrier. It's just like that. Like, what do I have? What are my tools? How do I get used to using them. It also feels like a really high risk intervention to do a suicide assessment. I think a lot of them feel that and they're just like, eh, I don't know. That's okay. You can refer to someone else who's an expert. But there is this kind of resentment I, I hear from some of the pediatricians of like, I wasn't trained to do this and now I'm expected to just do this. And it's really scary. I get that. Uh, Julia, um, mm -hmm. is, is it also part of VMAP to, I, I think one of the original intents, but it may have shifted since they now have um, uh, you and, and navigators and uh, uh, folks on staff, but I know they were trying to enroll local mental health providers as well, so that they had, um, so VMAP had a full um, uh, complement of resources to refer families. Is that still part of VMAP to, to do that kind of enrollment? Kind of. So the Cameron Gallagher Resource Center was our kind of our core resource gathering mo modality, and they'd had this system for a long time of entering things in and then updating it every six months. And it just it was becoming very cumbersome to do it for the whole state because they had full-time staff to do it for the Richmond area. So instead they've partnered with, um, what's it called? Unite Us. Have you guys heard of Unite Us? It, it's a big initiative, um, a lot of investment in it. It's, it's kind of useful so far. It's, I've been interested in to see how it's unrolled. Um, but they've really invested in that and in getting local providers who we refer to frequently on there so that we can send them referrals on there. We also try to partner with places that we call a lot. Like if we're referring somebody out to a place, we're usually calling them too. Like, like we know these places. <laughs> we know the providers we're sending them to because we're doing this all day. Um, I do it alongside Millie very closely, like guiding and making sure that that we're, we're always doing pretty much always doing a consult, if not really looking at, at what they need. If they if the doctor isn't very specific about what they need, then we're going to do a consult. It's, it's kind of common that they'll call for care navigation and say, Oh, he needs a therapist. And I'll say for what? Oh, for eating disorder. And I'll be like, Oh, what level of care <laughs> are we talking? Uh, oh, I didn't think about that. I just thought eating disorder treatment. Like, okay, well, is this like, like, what is uh, 
vitals, you know, last time they ate, hydration status, <laughs> like this could be a 911 emergency or it could be, okay, yeah, we'll get back to them in a couple of days for a therapist. And so kind of talking through that, we were very, making sure that we're very clinically accurate with what we're referring people to. We're not just sending lists or anything like that, but we do not keep, um, actively keep our own list of providers now that we only refer to. We're really looking broadly and with telehealth, we're all, all of us therapists and care navigators are talking throughout the state and linking up teens and, and kids who are very verbal with experts across the state through telehealth. That's been an amazing thing since COVID. So like eating disorders, for example, it can get you in with, there's a bunch of people in Charlottesville who are awesome. <laughs> it can get you in with someone over there who can be your telehealth person. But especially with eating disorders, you have to see someone in person too. And so that's where you can partner with the primary care doctor. Make sure they have releases and they coordinate really well. Maybe you can see an in-person nutritionist. That's kind of how we try to guide people. Billy, I have a question. Um, I This to me seems like such a self-evidently good idea and a like a positive um, I really don't see the downside. Um, so I feel like I'm missing something of why um, there's any resistance at all to this, this spreading out. And I wonder where you are with capacity. Like um, when I see a slide and it says you'll, you'll be returned in 30 minutes, um, you know, that's not my experience with just about any specialty referral or ask for help. Uh, so I think that's awesome. And you think that if that even happened once, it would just potentially people calling and calling and calling. So can you kind of just sort of help me? Where am I? What am I missing? What What is the, what can we do to make this happen better? Definitely. Thanks, Rob. That's a really good question. Um, and I struggled to understand it too, because I really saw myself as kind of like a hostess, like here's the menu order what you want. <laughs> you know, I don't have to explain it. You know what you like, you you can order it like you're, you're, you're here as a, as a provider, like, I'm not going to tell you what you need. But I'm finding that a lot of private providers don't know what they need, necessarily. And it's scary not to know something, especially a pediatrician or primary care provider, they know so much, they're experts on so many things. Like they have to know a little bit about so many things that not knowing about something is a little scary. There's also this, um, scarcity mindset that is really sunk in almost to the point of rejecting help i've presented and tried to help physicians sometimes who are like no this is too good what's the catch like they literally cannot wrap their head around it because it's too perfect and they've just been so used to doing things for so long by themselves and not getting any help and not being heard and having all these seriously ill patients dumped feeling like they're dumped on them I'm also starting to really understand what it's like to be a primary care provider. There's really no end date for your patient. Like you don't finish with them. I mean, if they're a pediatrician, they grow up, right? But you don't um, have like a an end goal. Like in mental health, we always have an end goal of discharging them, getting them better and discharging them. But in primary care, they're always yours, whether they're ill or whether they're doing well, you're always kind of tied to them in that patient provider relationship. And it kind of just goes on. And that can be an interesting and sometimes overbearing thing for them to feel with seriously mentally ill patients or families who are really tricky to work with, who seem help rejecting or who aren't, something's not clicking and they're not getting the care or they're not talking openly or something's going on. And that can be really disheartening for a lot of providers. So I think it's a bunch of things, but main things I would say would be COVID and just that scarcity mindset of like, no one's helped us before. And then there's almost a grieving process I see people go through of like, they're, they're literally thinking of all these patients that they couldn't help. You can like see it on their face. I know that if you're a pediatrician long enough, you have a suicide in your practice. It's just stats. And so I know that that is something that, that hurts them. That's part of the reason why Dr. The main reason why we have VMAP is Dr. Chung had a really serious um, problem in her practice. One of her patients killed somebody. And she's very open talking about it. It was a tragedy and it deeply affected their entire practice because the kid had a pediatrician, a, a pediatric psychiatrist who retired and he was on wait list and wait list to get in with somebody and they were trying their best to manage his meds and just, he went very badly and he killed somebody. And it was just so tragic for their practice. And she talks about it. So connecting with that, that kind of grief is tough. 
especially in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> so there's a lot of things to confront. What do you think, uh, Greg? To ask maybe a, a corollary question to Rob's. I mean, for those communities that you've seen the most success, what do you attribute that to? I mean, what was the rallying point that allowed you to be successful somewhere where maybe somewhere else it just, you haven't been able to get a foothold? It's usually a senior doctor in a practice who models it, who makes time for it, who allows other people to make time for it, who values it, who leans in when it's tricky. That's what I've seen mostly is it's like a senior doctor or somebody who's kind of like mentoring it. Rob, Rob had asked about capacity uh, and, I, and yeah. I asked the same question, Rob, you know, if they ratchet up, you've got the funding to hire people, right, Julia? It yes. sounded like that. We have money to have another Millie when we need her. And we're hoping to, like, I have goals for that. I want that to happen in the next few months. If I'm doing my job right, I told her she's going to be too busy soon. That's my goal. That's why they built in the funding to have two care navigators up here in Northern Virginia, because they know we're carrying, we're carrying most of the population of the state. So it makes sense. And we, of course we work, you know, along with the capacity question, remember what I said, none of us are in clinic. None of the psychiatrists are in clinic. They're only doing VMAP consults. So that means at any given time, we have up to five therapists and five psychiatrists. Now we're not using all of our psychiatrists time. We're trying to titrate because we don't want to use all our budget just to have them sitting around, but we are staying quite busy. We're finding that we're more and more busy with care navigation than psychiatry. It seems that people do education. They do a lot of consulting and get comfortable. And then they're like, okay, I'm good. I know what my kid needs. And they feel more comfortable to start a medication or to do screenings because they know that if they want them to get in care, we'll take from there. We'll like take over and kind of get them really quickly help and follow up that account accountability to really follow up until they're seen, not just like a list of referrals. So I think that allows a lot of those anxieties um, and maybe prior failures or disappointments to kind of be addressed and then we can move forward. But we have capacity to take lots and lots of calls. <laughs> hey, Rob. You know, I, I'm excited that it goes up to the age of 22. Do you have many patients that are in that, you know, that are adults, but younger adults? Yes, yes, yes. Many That's men. what we're finding is that that is a huge need an underserved age range. It's sort of like a mental health black hole. <laughs> and it's very dangerous for people who have a serious behavioral health issue or are developing a serious behavioral health issue not to have continuity of care through there. A lot of pediatricians are holding on to their kids through age 22 or 23 when they have serious mental illnesses or serious health issues in general, because they know that that leap from pediatrics to family, well, sometimes they'll start start getting into a family practice, which is better for continuity, but a leap between a pediatric specialist world and then an adult specialist world, there's like that hard and fast wall. And it's very difficult for somebody who's in that transition to adulthood, maybe going to college or starting to leave home for the first time is a very vulnerable time. So we do a lot of work with them and we call mm -hmm. them directly. Um, if we have their per explicit permission, we work with a parent, but most of the time we're working directly with our 18, 19, 20, 21 and 22 year olds. And as long as they're 22, when someone calls, we don't like kick them out when they turn 23, we're still going to help them. <laughs> It, the state is actually talking about potentially expanding our age to maybe 25. We've been trying to push for that. Because we know that, that neurologically, a lot of things change mm -hmm. for girls around 22 and for young men around 25. So, Greg, what does your practice do? Do you all see it, the mental health issues? Um, we're uh, pediatric subspecialty, so like, uh, pediatric sleep, pediatric surgery, pediatric uh, pulmonary, so not really. It's okay. more the, yeah. I, I think when you show that map with the workforce shortage for uh, mental health clinicians, I mean, it certainly echoes all of our experience in living and working here. Uh, so any answer that kind of potentiates what primary care doctors can do really is the only way out of it until a massive change in what is available in trained clinicians. Um, 
And every time you have a successful uh, connection where a primary care doctor gets help and then can continue to take care of that patient, like you said, successfully, you know, then maybe the next time they'll feel a little more comfortable knowing what to do next. And I, I just think it's a cool model. Um, and That's the cool I can't really see any other way to, to go. Sometimes they'll tell me, oh, I haven't called you in forever, Juliet. I'm like, that that's good, right? <laughs> that means you haven't had any questions. You got this. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, this, it's always been the case that mental health concerns come into the primary care office first, unless it's a crisis or unless there's law enforcement or something. So um, there's no way to successfully address these problems until they can be addressed in that setting too. I know my, my wife's practice, um, she would tell you that she spends 40% of her day doing mental health care and um, she's a general pediatrician, you know. And I was just on a, a conference call. Following her about and they leave and they say, all I did was learn about mental health. And, well, that's what we do all day. Yeah, I was just on a conference call and they said that 33% of kids coming to ANOVA emergency rooms were there for behavioral health issue in the last month. 33%. That's up from like 13-ish from years past. Whew, it's quite a fall. Year it's and quite a, a fall. Very hard on young people and their mental health and their socialization and their yes. general satisfaction with the way their life is going. So it's, it's only been worse lately. Yeah, so definitely an increase um, in emergency room visits for pediatric mental health. Definitely an increase in primary care visits for pediatric mental health. And I think better and better screening, you know, as they've made requirements for different kinds of screening, I think we're catching more and earlier, which can feel like it's a, you know, its own kind of pandemic of mental health. But I think it's because we're talking about it. Kids are very aware of mental health. A lot of kids ask for a therapist now. When I was in high school, nobody would even know to ask for a therapist, <laughs> but I'm hearing a lot of young people advocating, like saying, no, I need to talk to a therapist, mom. Can you find me a therapist, dad? I need, yeah. Or I want to get on some meds for this anxiety. This is too much. I can't focus on my tests. Lots of things like that. So they're advocating. So I think we're seeing a lot more identification of what's there as well. I mean, this, this committee and, and the people on this call are interested in increasing access and trying to make things easier here where we are. Um, what The other thing that struck me about your presentation was when I looked at that map, I saw our Fauquier County in bright red as a shortage area, and it's contiguous to Culpeper, which is bright green because of, as you said, I'm sure it's the UVA uh, outpost. Uh, it's crazy that they're right next to each other. Um, I wonder what opportunity that is for us, um, but I think there is one. And, Maybe there are ways we can be working more closely and directly with those folks. And that map is specifically north. for psychiatrists, but we found that when we did look at it for therapists and other services, it, it did generally mirror it. So we just used the psychiatrist as sort of a shorthand. The other thing I'm noticing in the last few years is more and more nurse practitioners who will see kids um, psychiatric nurse practitioners. And that's a really cool opportunity for kids and young people to get seen sooner, but also sort of concerning for people who have really serious and complex mental health and physical health issues. Um, because the psychiatric nurse practitioners, in my experience, don't have the real, really in-depth um, training, medical training around some of the strange complexities of how different medications, different health conditions can impact. Now for a regular straightforward healthy kid with mental health issues, it's awesome they can get seen sooner. But I'm also seeing a lot of confusion sort of like in the market about what is a nurse practitioner? When can I see one of those? And what is a child and adolescent psychiatrist? When should I see one of those? So we're Millie and I are trying to work on how we talk around that. Well, luckily we work with a really awesome nurse practitioner, a doctor of nurse practitioner doctorate and he's helped sort of guide me in understanding scope of practice um, from Keller Center because he works with kids and he works alongside all of our um, psychiatrists at the Keller Center and really kind of understanding what is the difference there and what kind of patients would be really well served by going there and others who would be really well served by probably seeing a psychiatrist. 
Lots of things though. Yeah, Julia, we have one nurse practitioner with the um, psychiatric specialization in the county, in Fauquier County, none in Rappahannock. And I think well, there's one in like Middleburg too, right? Which isn't too far from Dr. What's her name? Dr. Donna, I think. I'm forgetting. Definitely a need for more. Um, another kind of just economy of behavioral health that I've seen and, and a question I've asked many times is there's this need, <laughs> there's funding for the need. Why isn't the market, the free market supplying <laughs> the, you know, supply, supply and demand, right? And I'm finding that um, psychiatric fellowships for child and adolescent psychiatry are not getting filled. Doctors aren't wanting to do it. It's an extra level of training. It's more deferring of your loans and more interest. Um, there just isn't a whole lot of support for fellowships, which is kind of too bad on its own. And then there's not a lot of recruiting into our state. So we only have a couple of fellowship programs for child and adolescent psychiatry with VCU and I think UVA. And so if we had more, maybe like, why doesn't Innova have one? I've asked. <laughs> if we have more, then maybe they'll stay. <laughs> So that's another kind of just another thought. But um, a lot of places are tell us doing like telepsych for psychiatrists and nurse practitioners from other states. And that leads just like to another like layer of how well can you assess and treat an elementary school age person over telehealth? Like, aren't they better seen in the office? Mm -hmm. Julia, what, what is the participation rate um, in our, our um, in Fauquier um, from uh, with the map? You guys have got two people registered, but I think more people call. Now that I'm thinking about it, Renee, a lot of people aren't registered, but they still call. We try, we like hound them to register, <laughs> but sometimes they don't want to register. That's fine. We've got Dr. Jacob and then Rob's wife. <laughs> <laughs> They're the two so that are registered. None of the, the like Piedmont family practice or the primary I've tried care. tried reaching out to them, yeah. Mm -hmm. if, if you want to get further depressed, you can read the link that I threw up there. <laughs> Some of you probably saw it yesterday, but it was from the Virginia Mercury, Julia, and it's uh, just about the shortages in mental health providers and, and, and the ages of our psychiatrists today, and they're all aging out, uh, going to retire soon. And as you're saying, the pipeline is nowhere near going to produce these types of professionals, and not just psychiatrists, but um, but the Virginia Healthcare Foundation, Debbie Oswald's group, has done some good research on this, and it's outlined in this article. Yes, we got our work cut out for us on that front. You know, mm -hmm. I think. Oh, Dr. Gleason, yeah, she's one of our VMAP psychiatrists <laughs> down in the uh, eastern region at, at um, CHKD. Yeah, I got excited. Our, you know, I was talking to people because we saw the article on the new um, pediatric psych hospital that um, King's Daughters is putting, you know, is opening in 2022. And they were, you know, talking about how they're going to hire 400 people. And I was like, can, can we make the, that they have to come from like out of state? We already have too few. We don't need people leaving us to go work at this new, you know, 14 story hospital. But yeah, I've heard that they have to push back the opening because they can't staff it. Mm -hmm. They've built it, it's beautiful. It's really cool too. They're gonna have um, basically rooms where a parent can stay with their kid, their teenager overnight, you know, even the whole time, if, it's, if that's helpful for their treatment. Mm -hmm. As we all know, sometimes getting a break from your parents is the number one reason to go to the hospital. <laughs> and I'll, I'll give you my editorial opinion on this. This is this, the world according to Greg and nothing else. But I, I think that um, the hierarchy of reimbursement is proceduralists. They make the most. Uh, E&M codes, you know, primary care providers don't make nearly as much. And then mental health providers are rung below that. And because the economic incentive isn't there for people to go into the specialty, they're not. And I think until the reimbursement system is overhauled, um, it's going to be a subsidy situation. So health systems like ANOVA, you know, have to take responsibility for that because the private market isn't paying for it. And, you know, I think 
I think it's unfortunate. It's not fair the way that different healthcare services are valued, you know, from an RBU standpoint, but that's where the system is. And to think that it's going to be anything other than that, at least in the short term, I, you know, so the Path Foundation, VMAP, I mean, all these programs, I think are going to be, are going to carry the burden for, for this. I don't think it's going to change anytime soon. And that's just real unfortunate. Yeah, that's how we have it at the Keller Center. The reason we have all these amazing psychiatrists at the Keller Center is because they're recruited and they're cultured. <laughs> and the foundation, Dr. Likewise, raises a lot of money and the foundation helps support them being able to see kids that are undocumented, have Medicaid, have TRICARE and reimburse like no money and want 15 minute appointments. All of our doctors do minimum 30 minute appointments. They don't do 15 minutes med, med visit appointments. They see them every week or two if needed. They make phone calls to their, their therapists. This is all like stuff that's like best practice, right? That's what keeps a psychiatrist going is if they're able to give good care to their kids. And if they're not able to do that, if uh, if they're working, for example, at Kaiser, they have to do unlimited intakes. You guys already know this. I'm preaching to choir. Unlimited intakes for mental health. That means that you have to see new people every week, even though you have nowhere to see them as a follow-up. You're booked out six months, but you still have to see new people every week. So it's like, depressing it's demoralizing mm -hmm. but you're right that the foundation takes on that burden of saying you know what we're going to pay for about half of our our doctor's salaries so that they can spend twice as much time to give excellent care to everybody even if they have medicaid or they're uninsured mm -hmm. and that and makes unfortunately, it a much easier place to work if it's not in a i'll say something semi-controversial in a community that has a for-profit provider in it, you're not going to get the health system support because it's not a service line that, that makes money. So, you know, it's going to fall to the PATH Foundation, it's going to fall to the free clinic, it's going to fall to VMAP. And, you know, for those communities that don't have a resource like the PATH Foundation, what do they do? And there's, there's more of them in Virginia than not. <laughs> I mean, I think we're the exception to the rule there. So it's just... Well, we, know, we know where that ends. That ends with poverty. Yeah. It ends with crime ends with addiction and hopelessness. And those are all things that cost money. <laughs> and there's no better investment than the health and physical and mental health of a child. We know that we know that through much research, that if we can intervene with kids and young adults who are having behavioral health issues soon and quick and comprehensively that we can prevent the need for hospitalizations and unemployment and disability and all those other things. So you guys all know that. <laughs> it's the best use of a dollar. <laughs> All right, our hour is almost up. Um, any other comments, questions, quick questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna... just wondering what it is that the Mental Health Association could do that would um, at least um, uh, move the, the ball a little bit forward in our community. Um, this strikes me as exactly the kind of thing we have talked about for several years and it's being implemented in a way, it was hard to figure out how to pull it off for one community, but this makes so much sense. We were talking not just children, but, but especially for children. Um, it just, it breaks my heart if it's not really being used by people. So um, I, I don't know, we, we do have a, you talked about physician champions, um, um, uh, Piedmont Pediatrics has been that that champion. Um, I, I'm not sure what else we can do. I mean, I was imagining every time I go to Piedmont Family Practice, um, kind of saying, hey, guys. <laughs> um, but I don't know what else we can do. But I, I think it's if, if there's if there's a way to uh, advance this, it would be fantastic. I kind of go back to that marketing thing five times. People need to see something five times. They need to hear about it five times before it sticks. So as a marketing tactic, if you can just keep talking about VMAP, keep referencing it, if you've used it or, you know, you can say, you know me. <laughs> but Sally, try... maybe when all of us go into Piedmont family practice, we go in five times. <laughs> <laughs> go five times in a row too. They, not just five from you know me but we all go in there and tell right. 
And I'll continue trying to reach out um, to them as well. We send emails. I'm going to try to go around in person to a bunch of providers and drop off information. Sometimes having something physical is very different than just being emailed stuff. We're all buried with emails. <laughs> and so that, maybe maybe oh. somebody already, you know, kind of inferred this. But if if Diana Chalmetta and Josh Jacob are <laughs> agreeable to being our physician champions. Would it not be the role of the Mental Health Association to facilitate that within the community and try to help them be that resource and coordinate primary care meetings and, you know, all the things that need to happen? That, that seems like the, the secret sauce to me. But. And so, Greg, we've already created the list. Now, the, the funny thing about our footprint is that Falkir is with Julia and Rappahannock even though there are only a couple providers out there. And so Julia has tried to sort of woo them to give us Rappahannock for a little bit until the That's fine. Western, Western they just up. Yeah, they just press a different number when they call. It's the exact okay. same stuff and they can still call me too. Okay. Like but, I said, we, we work across. So if a call comes in and I'm busy, it rolls over to them. I mean, we work as a team, but yes, they're technically across that little color line <laughs> in a different region of EMAP. So we already have a list of, you know, we created a list of all our family practitioners, primary care physicians, anyone else that might be sort of tertiary to that. And so Julia has that. Um, and then I wanted to record this so that, you know, for the physician or maybe the office manager that doesn't want to like commit to going to a meeting, they can just watch this recording. And that might also spur a little more interest you know, give them a better understanding before they sit with their peers to talk about it. There's only one thing I learned in 20 years being here. And I mean, if it was really, there was only one thing uh, is if you want to talk to doctors, then the only way to do it is other doctors to talk to them for you. So you're having a champion is really the only way that is going to penetrate. And if if Diana and Josh go over and talk to their peers at a, at a meeting or something, they will be listened to um, in a way that none of us can, can get. So, that is that is 100% mm -hmm. true. And, you know, I think, again, this is an anecdotal comment, but I think it's true. I think Sally mentioned we, we've been struggling with this for, for years and, you know, everything from a clearinghouse kind of doing what you're doing with staff, you know, mental health providers to putting them in the primary care practice. And my, my famous line is once you've seen one primary care practice, you've seen one primary care practice, right? Cause they all operate a little bit differently and have a little bit um, different so way. That they, <laughs> right. So they have their own culture and their own language. Right. So I think part of this is about control, right? I think part of it is about, um, you know, making the case is it is it better doing it the way that you're doing understanding that you're you're not able to treat all these patients or do you want to give up a little control and you know and give them access to resources that, that you may not be 100 percent directing and you know i i think we can name the pro, the pro providers in the Fauquier community that kind of fit into that category that that are reluctant to do that and you know, but but I think just making the case this this is a much better alternative for their patients. It's not about them, you know. It's about it's about their patients and what's better for them. So I think that's kind of the message, you know, that in part anyway needs to be delivered to the community. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but or if that's been a challenge in in your eyes. But that's that's kind of the way I've seen it for years. <laughs> so. I try to bring a psychiatrist with me whenever I do a lunch and learn, especially these virtual ones, they can hop right on. Because remember, I have psychiatrists sitting all over the state ready to consult. They're not seeing patients. <laughs> I have captive psychiatrists. And I do find that when I bring one of them with me and I, I make them talk first, mm -hmm. then, then it just everything from there is just so much more open. You know, they've endorsed me. They've said that I'm okay to talk to. <laughs> You know, I'm not scary from the outside behavioral health world, kind of cut here to judge them or look down on them. Then it's like, okay, we talk common language as doctors and providers. You're very wise. I think that's a great approach. Yeah, it, it is a great approach. And, you know, I don't know if like, if, if, if you know, Jacob and Chalmeda can help with the convening, you got the psychiatrist, 
And, and, and honestly, Julia, you're, you're incredible at this work, you know, in terms of the, in the outreach and the way you share Thank this you. information. And um, I, it's, it, I I'm think very that, passionate about it. I really believe in it. Well, because <laughs> remember, I, I worked downstream for a long time, too. And I feel like a lot of these PCPs are downstream, you know, kind of just well, getting flooded. Yeah. And it's so well, nice that all to comes through. That okay. all comes through in, in a non-judgmental <laughs> way. And it is compelling. And so I think that, that, that it, maybe that's a direction we work towards here locally. You know, use our, our champions to convene you know, hopefully get a few folks out. And then, I mean, if we get one or two converts, it's huge, you know, it's, um, yeah, they all fall from there. They all call yeah. and say, Oh, you talked to my colleague, but I've never called before. And I'm like, great. What's your name? I already know which colleague it is. <laughs> you know, you tell me your practice name. I'm like, yes, I talk to them all the time. <laughs> that just makes me feel like so happy. We've got another one. <laughs> I'm like, yes, we've got another one, <laughs> but it's okay if it's only one too. If it's only one, it just, you know, it starts that trickle, you know, and sometimes they'll just start by calling with just their most difficult kids or like in a crisis. And I'm like, that's okay. Like, that's my chance. Like, cause that's what I do. I work in those higher levels of care. That's where I've always liked working is doing in home, doing PHP and IOP. So a crisis or like, what do I do? Hospital, police, all that stuff is, that's all good for me. <laughs> I'm comfortable in that. And I think that does help as well because it's something they're very intimidated about, like TDOs and ECOs and all that. I used to, I did all that. So sometimes they'll call with an emergency and then from there be like, okay, now that you're cool, can I call, ask you questions about something else? But yeah, it's one of our biggest conundrums with VMAP is why, um, why it's difficult to get the word out and get people using it. So we would definitely appreciate all of your help and your thoughts. If you, if this kind of, you know, percolates and you sit on it and think of other ideas for me or feedback for me, I'm very open to that. Um, and, you know, I'm at your disposal. If you think I can come to a meeting or get looped in with somebody or going to give my number to somebody, <laughs> please invite them to look at the website to call us. It was funny yesterday, um, Carolyn Lamb with Falkir County Public Schools got so excited. She was like, no. I need you to come talk to my social workers. Then my social workers will talk to the doctors and say, why aren't you doing VMAP? You know, it's there, they could help us. So we'll go at them at all different angles. All right, any other comments or questions? I love That's it when, a, I love it when there's an hour long meeting that actually goes slightly over because people are interested. Yeah, well, Renee, thanks for getting this coordinated. Julia, thank you for, for being here. I'm, I'm so glad I was here because I did learn a lot more today. And uh, this is probably, you know, one of the most helpful meetings uh, that I've been involved in in, in some time. So uh, yeah, it's really good. Thank you very much. Great. And maybe Thanks, Julia, and maybe Rob's doctor will be the first to sign up. <laughs> first to sign up for what? For VMAP. Oh, or Dr. King, get her on. I'll walk downstairs right now. Just, I just call. So there's this whole thing they used to tell them they had to register first before calling. I got rid of that. I'm like, no, no. Yeah, that was smart. That was dumb. Yeah. Just call us. We'll register oh, you later. We'll get you registered later. Give me your phone number. Give me your email address. Julia, got you you're now. very good at this. I can tell. Well, I feel like I understand doctors. That's I worked matters. alongside of a bunch of really good ones. So know where it's at thank you all for your for your support and for having me today i really appreciate all of your time and coming together and your support of this and very excited and i think it's a very hopeful thing like vmap is a very hopeful message that we can address this onslaught of, of mental health needs that's great yeah thank you so much thank everybody. you thanks we will take thanks. this recording okay. we'll take this recording and put it on our um on our website through our youtube channel and that way if anyone wants to send anyone to it to look at it, it will be there. Awesome. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.